One of the things I say a lot, I think, is if the bug bounty scene was as prevalent when I was coming up and doing all this stuff, I probably would have gravitated more towards that than the, um, you know, like the, the criminal activity. But uh, yeah, like I love hacking. It's like the curiosity, the adversarial mindset, just breaking things, like figuring out how things work. Welcome to AOL. You've got post. Welcome. You've got mail. Would you please state your handle in the years you were active on AOL? Yes, my government name is Bryce Case Jr. I go by YT Cracker. And I started playing around with AOL around 96 or 97, but I didn't really get serious on it until 98. Got it. And so when did you first use a computer? I was sort of at an advantage because my dad worked for a defense contractor and he was an electrical engineer. So I had computers in my house probably when it wasn't so common. So my first computer was a uh, Timex Sinclair, like a ZX Spectrum, like 1K of memory. But I used to, I started using computers probably when I was three, four years old <laughs> type thing. I just was fascinated with them. And, uh, I would, uh, in magazines and books back then, they would, you could transcribe basic code from these uh, sources and run the programs that you wanted to and make alterations to them. But uh, it was just kind of a cool exercise where you would just type something in and then uh, you make the game that was in the magazine. Uh, then I had a TI-99 uh, 4A, which was TI Basic. That at least had a tape drive. But yeah, again, um, very much dating myself that this was 1980s, peak of 1980s computing. Cool. I think I only had like an Apple IIe. Uh, I believe when the Chronic came on, he said that he was doing kind of the same thing, just programming from the, the magazines and stuff. I, I guess I, I wish I had parents that, that showed me that stuff back then. <laughs> I, I say it a lot. Like I know I was very fortunate, especially at that age, to have access to computers because the Apple IIs were in my preschool and my uh, elementary schools. But yeah, I would say that at that time, it wasn't as common for people to have a personal computer at home yet. Cool. Do you remember, maybe we should start with BBS days, because I believe you said at some point you, you were in the BBS scene. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, that actually dovetails into the question you were about to ask. So um, I also, by virtue of my father being um, connected and, and everything, uh, I was actually on the internet or what would be known as the internet, prior to even being on AOL. So uh, he had a slip account for his work. Uh, I think statute of limitations, quote unquote, is probably up on it. Uh, hopefully it don't take away his pension or something, but obviously I was playing around on it. There was uh, a lot, like I was super big into the BBS scene locally that I co sysopped a couple of boards and I ran one of my own. But there was this one BBS that I connected to quite frequently I don't know if you remember when Nuke, uh, when when Nuke had come out the port 139 booter. I thought that that was hilarious because on IRC you'd go on and, and then with, with Fnet it never obfuscated the addresses. So back then anybody that was running Windows at the time, you just kick them offline with one of those packets. And uh, I was just on this BBS talking to one of the sysops there, and uh, he was like, "Yo, if you think that's crazy, you should go on AOL because." You punt anybody offline, and <laughs> it just all, the AOL is like this giant playground, and so that's when I took it seriously and decided to check it out. Oh, interesting. Okay, so you're on. So the origin story, I guess, of this is you're on the BBS scene, and someone's like, "If if you want to be a real asshole, go over to AOL." <laughs> yeah, if you want to. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> yeah, I could just well. And again, speaking to the quality of the people that were on AOL, because it was meant to be easy to use and so very accessible. A lot of people that weren't necessarily computer savvy were, uh, you know, experiencing the internet through America Online. And uh, in those days, I mean, even on television and stuff, people weren't advertising websites as much as they were advertising AOL keywords. And so yeah, it was just a weird position in the zeitgeist. But yeah, that I probably had the backwards trajectory where I started on IRC and uh, like Telnet MUDs and stuff and then migrated over uh, BBSs and then migrated over to AOL. 
do you remember on IRC with like there was a whole ratio thing if you wanted to get like whereas or something you would upload a certain amount before you could download a certain amount did you recall anything like that oh yeah of course like the dcc bots and uh yeah that that was another thing that was cool about AOL was they had these what's called server rooms like and they kept getting banned, but it was server, then server with a C, then server with a Z, and they were numbered like one through blank. And uh, they operated pretty much the same way that the IRC servers did where you would send a chat command and then it would give you a list of the files that you were able to download. But the advantage to using AOL's service for wares was that you didn't download peer to peer the way you would in IRC. Uh, so some people on slower connections, like people were hacking a lot of university shells and stuff to um, deliver wares back then. Uh, but with AOL, you would just type in the number <laughs> of the packages you want. So they'd RAR or zip it in a series of nine. And then you would say, okay, send me, you know, slash send one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then you would download them from AOL. So AOL servers were who was serving it. So it, it gave you a little bit more like on in modem times when <laughs> everything uh, was very, very slow. Uh, it was a lot better because AOL would be a de- like a dedicated, so it was connected. So I found the wares experience on AOL to be far superior as well. Yeah, I found it great as well. I remember they, I think it was like 15 megabyte for, e- for each RAR file. I forget the maximum file size, but I do remember sometimes you would get like a bad RAR file and you do like the cyclic redundancy check. It was like SFV. Yep. I'm trying to remember if they had par files or not back in the day. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I don't. I mean, like 7-zip wasn't a thing. Like there was chunked zips uh, sometimes, like I said, that there was. uh, But yeah, the RARs, yeah, you'd spend an entire week or something downloading R00, R01, R02. And then, yeah, at the very end, (laughs) you try to go and uh, blow it up and you'd have corrupted archives. So that was just a... I was kind of involved tangentially in some of the wares groups back then. So it was easy to get because the scene, there's a lot of competition that um, drove the scene. And so if there were missing files or bad files that needed re-uploading, like the groups were actually really, really diligent about getting their releases back up and stuff. So uh, that the customer support in the wares scene (laughs) was also superior. So if you did download some corrupted file, uh, you usually could tap somebody on the shoulder and get the, get the one you wanted. Yeah, people were very good about that. It's kind of like when you're driving your car and like uh, you know somebody lets you in or something. It's kind of it's kind of like that. Just it, it's it's this totally normal thing. It's like oh yeah, you're you're missing this one file and everyone wants to help out. So <laughs> that was always good. Yep, very much so. So you got an AOL? Did you go to the new user chat room or <laughs> um, like how did you find the scene? No. So that's the thing is I kind of had the warm intro. So uh, the private room that I first was in, I think was Havoc. And that was the location that the Havoc Platinum had the Havoc series of programs. There were, there was a bunch of ones that were written after like the popular programs of the day. So there's FadeX had a room. Back in 97, I was just a little maverick. Came on from IIC into a private room called Havoc. From there, I met a few cats that said they liked to hack. They called it punting, and I called it whack. But in every method was a But then one of my neighbors was kind of a miscreant on AOL at the time. And he was actually the guy that I wrote my first prog with and released, but... Yeah, I was sort of, I was already kind of in the AOL hacker scene immediately. And then there was like PR Jade, API turned into AXI, which turned into IXA. And IXA was like another major hangout. Uh, there was a root. There was a few kind of staple private rooms or whatever that, and these micro gangs that sort of hung out in them, just like IRC channels. Uh, but yeah, I just, I immediately was already kind of in the, cool kids club in the private rooms, which was, which was good. VIP red carpet. Nice. I mean, so personally, I just hung out in the warehouse rooms and I think I was like a shizza or whatever in the shizza room generator. But like, I would talk with people sometimes about programming, but it sounds like these other rooms, were they much more about like programming or carding spamming or what, what was going on in those other rooms? Yeah, I would say that a lot of it was, there was an article that was written not too long ago I think it's it's hosted on GitHub. Uh, you probably have seen it. It's the one about open source software and the effects of the AOL ecosystem. Did you have you seen that? Oh yeah, yeah. I think I'm quoted in that actually. Are you? Yeah. 
it's such it was such, like I'd kind of just gone through it. But what was really cool back then, I mean, people still had some guarded methods and everything, uh, but it, largely we were all into sharing like our module files uh, for Visual Basic. So the, the to back up a little bit, the second language that I really got into was C um, and the, then C++. But a lot of what people were doing on the Windows side uh, in th those days was all Visual Basic. So it's Visual Basic 3, 4, 16-bit, then 4, 32-bit, and uh, 5 and 6. Uh, you know, that was kind of the trajectory uh, that a lot of people... So the the wealth of what was programmed at that time was largely done for Visual Basic. So there was these base file, the .bas files that uh, had a lot of already the subclassing was already done for the API and some common functions. Uh, so these rooms sort of were really collaborative. If people were looking for an interesting way to do things or, or whatever, there was an open forum that we could talk uh, about kind of the methods that we were doing. But everyone was kind of, yeah, we'd see each other's programs and be like, oh, that's a cool feature. Like, how do I implement that in my thing? Like the chat command phase, there was a, a whole period of time where we were just doing um, the same way that the where servers and stuff would read what was in the they do wm get text on the on the chat window this was that was prior to a04 because it became rich text and stuff or two five and three but then um yeah that the point I, I guess of those rooms was more yeah how do we figure out cool things to do uh it wasn't necessarily about hacking AOL at that time it was just yeah what was what cool features could you put into your stuff and make it work Okay. And so at some point, it, it sounds like maybe it became about hacking AOL. So, I mean, did you, first of all, did you release any programs there? Like, did you like have a program you released to everybody or did you just kind of keep them to yourself? Or My most famous one was called Concert. Uh, and it was, um, there was a period of time where America Online didn't properly check credit cards for AOL Canada. And it was around a time so, so to give some context, AOL screen names had to start with a capital first letter. That was one of the naming decisions uh, that when you're trying to create a screen name, like they all had capital letters. But when AIM came on the scene, you could mutate the case of your screen name. And so it became fashionable to have lowercase screen names on AOL. And one of the ways to do that was you had to create an AOL account from your AIM account. The Canadian, if you had a Canadian cert, so the same when the AOL used to mail CDs uh, and have them everywhere, <laughs> and they would have a code on them. And sometimes they were one time use codes, sometimes they were reusable, like bulk kind of licenses or whatever. But as part of the registration process, you would need to put in this code. And then uh, you could go and sign on, you know, finish the sign on process, enter your credit card, name, address, blah, 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 and then create your account. Uh, so again, AOL Canada had this problem where you could send, because so credit cards have a format uh, with a checksum, like uh, still to this day, where you can determine the validity of a credit card if the if the number is correct, not necessarily if the credit card itself is valid, but just the, the number is correct. And I don't know exactly what the bug was, but you would just feed it like a series of valid credit cards once you got a, a decent prefix and you were able to get trial accounts on AOL Canada that would usually last for three days. And so this program concert automated that entire process for you. And it was a way to make I cases. And so <laughs> the I case name comes from L case, like lowercase, but capital I looks like an L. So uh, that's what the slang was for uh, something with a lower case first letter was an I case. Because before the only way that you could make something that looked lowercase was if you like if you wanted to be like Leet Steve, then you could do I E E T Steve, and it would look like Leet Steve in the chat room. But uh, so that's where the name I case comes from. Hopefully, that's explained properly. <laughs> did I did I nail it? Yeah, that that makes sense. I, I remember people that would like make their names a series of like capital I's and lowercase L's, and it was like yep. that was their whole name, and that was like their thing. <laughs> so it was yeah, it was confusing. If you didn't know how to uh, yeah copy paste or whatever, then yeah they. Like where I'm unpuntable because uh, yeah I have all this like convoluted name but yeah concert was pretty popular the first program I wrote was called Control Delete and it was just one of those multi programs like Havoc Fadex type thing uh, but probably what I was known for at the time was uh, 
these AO movies where I was making these stick figure animations with MIDI soundtracks uh, that were just these full length movies about AOL, like as if AOL was a real place and, you know, Town Square was a real place and the internals were like the police and all this stuff. So uh, those are the yeah the files that I sent you if you, for memory lane purposes. But I got known for that in the music, I think. Awesome, sweet. Uh, in the show notes, it, if you have any screenshots of this program, we'll, we'll put them in there and I'll just try to get the, the movies up there as well. Okay. Sweet. Um, okay, so you did some programming, you made some funny, funny movies. And then, so like for me, there was like the desktop application, AOL, and it took a long time for me to realize like there's protocols and stuff going on behind everything. I wasn't just like interfacing with the desktop app. I knew I was online, but like at some point, did you start to think like, like what's going on? Like how, how are we sending these commands to AOL? Or is it, I have been wondering how you got to that point. Was it the star tool that brought you there? Or, or I don't know, can you talk about that? So, uh, yeah, so for some context, because I got on kind of when AOL 3.0 32-bit was popular. So like AOL for Windows 95. Um, was kind of the major uh, thing. So it's like prior to four, uh, so it wasn't the fader stuff, but the master tool for 16-bit AOL, uh, so 2.5 and 3.0 was available um, at the time. And again, the internal documents, there was a few curators, I would say, Tao being among them. Um, there, was, we had, there was a group called Inside AOL and there was one called Observers. And I was affiliated with both those groups eventually, but I started getting more into, yeah, the internal workings of America Online. Like what, because I really, I was into web page defacement and stuff. So defacing keywords was something I always thought was funny uh, for the reasons I mentioned before. And that, you know, in order to do the form designer type stuff, there's a, like AOL had this idiomatic language to um, interface uh, with those keywords and edit them. Well, sorry, do you remember what that was called? Was that the FDO stuff or like Rain Man and uh, uh, I mean, form FDO was like the um, form display operator or something, I don't know, something, yeah. Um, but uh, Rain Man, what was was a scripting language? No, it was, um, yeah, like you could do so. There's accounts, so like if you had your business on like uh, AOL, like you could actually purchase a keyword the same way you would a domain, uh, and then you would have rights to basically edit and manipulate the like your keyword and then certain internals had access to do pretty much anything on any of these keywords like there was a strat of like a role-based access uh thing that kind of so it's like a cms almost i mean like a real shitty cms but <laughs> yeah yeah very shitty cms but it, yeah more like a yeah WYSIWYG type or like form designer the same way you would kind of design a form in, in visual basic except it was specific to america online but the fascination i think more came there was deprecated uh, forms that existed within America Online's invoke library. And f- so just for instance, there was one like old, so spamming it was, was probably like the next part of what I did on AOL because uh, I realized you could make a lot of money and spam a lot of people on AOL. <laughs> and it was prior to the rate limiting and uh, all of the compensating controls that they wound up putting in later. But that when you could invoke directly like the mail form instead of having to subclass and click the new mail and and set all the text and everything you could directly invoke these forms and there was a fad kind of around i would say 20 uh, 2002 2003 uh, that, so this is later on in in the game but that there was a form for instance that uh, it was f1 i remember there was M4, MN, M4, and then the M capital N was the like the kind of the real mail system. But the F1 token uh, was like this deprecated mail system that wasn't subject to rate limiting and everything after they'd already instituted it. So there was just these weird, in the catacombs of AOL, they had these deprecated forms and stuff that you could invoke and they would actually bypass some of the security controls on AOL. So that was super fascinating. Wait, so you could send, so you would invoke a form and the F, so the F1 token, it would, it would bring up a form and was there like a, like a two and a subject and a body or something? And then you would just fill it out? Yes, exactly. So it was the, it's, and if you looked at the packets, um, 
So yeah, we got into, you were talking about the protocols uh, and back then so was, P3 is the protocol that um, like every, every packet started with Z and then two asterisks. And uh, we would, I forgot who built the original proxy, but there, that um, you could edit your TCP C- CCL file, CSL file and connect to localhost and basically build a packet sniffing proxy on localhost that, so you're, AOL client would connect to the proxy and the proxy would connect out to AOL. And so you're able to dump all of the packets. So it was fairly easy. It's like Wireshark. You could see exactly what your client was sending to do things. And sorry, can we can we pause for a second? So this, this kind of sounds like, like Burp Suite or like a, like a web debugger. And could you, could you also pause and edit packets? Uh, yes. Well, that, that was function. Ha! Ah, that's so cool. Sorry. <laughs> That was what kind of came later. I mean, again, the first kind of iterations of these proxies were just to kind of get the pass through and see them. And, you know, we'd have them display in hex and we'd have them display in string and have them display, uh, you know, text and then, you know, made it so it was easy to pull out the strings and then just import them into your programs. But uh, yeah, that you could basically, yeah, pause packets, rewrite them, just the same. Yeah, think Burp Suite, that's a great way to put it. Um, it just as intermediary proxy with between AOL and, uh, and the client. But that's where a lot of the raw, like that you could see how like through the client, like when you would invoke these forms, like you could actually get the raw network calls. And then that's where the, the nomenclature like F1, M4, MN come from. So the F1 packet format, I'm, I'm probably, I'm sure I have the programs like somewhere on one of my hard drives to, to illustrate how this works, but that the way that that packet was identified with F1 was how you would send like you could send the the name, the BCC list, the subject, the body, and then you'd have to just chunk it properly. But with the M4MN method, um, that's the two in the subject went into the M4 packet and then the body went into the MN packet, if I'm remembering correctly. But that, yeah, that F1 method basically was not rate limited. And so, and you could send just zillions of emails off of the accounts. And so at the time it was really lucrative because no one else was really doing those types of things. He didn't do, he made us grab our dreams because money had our pockets busting at the seams. When you loaded sub spam in a private room, a million others loaded and they sang the same tune. I'm an icon of spam, I spam for cash. Seeing so much green, you think it was an episode of MASH. Back then you could spam all you wanted Fuck you way or well The spammers we taunted There were no rate limits And no gate Yeah, diving deep into America Online at that time Was just a, a lot of what I was doing Again, screwing with the keywords Like finding a lot of the hidden websites uh, We were shelling There was a TCL exploit on AOL server That we were able to root the web servers And then we'd log on to IRC Using um, the... AOL, uh, so we'd have AOL host names, which was a bit of a flex. I, I know one person got taken down for that, um, but even making like two letter and one letter screen names, this was all part of how this worked. And as you can see in AOL files, the reason that Star Tool existed to uh, like post that 3.0 was uh, my partner Glitch and I, we found this, it was like, a, it was listed as a, con- uh, a, a AOL debugger or something like that for AOL Canada and uh, Zero Divide, zero, uh, oh, zero, oh, I'm sure have you heard about him? Yeah. Legend of the game, Tim. Yeah, he... Uh, Actually, Tao t- t- was like, um, yeah, I, I didn't know that's what the, that guy's name was. We So Zero Divide is how you like pronounce it or something? Or? Yeah, that's how you pronounce the oh, zero, oh, yeah, Zero Divide. Uh, he would go by ZD sometimes, ZD or oh, zero, oh, but yeah, that he actually was the one who found out that that was just a repackaged master AOL. And so he hexed it and uh, got it to work. But uh, yeah, a lot of those post AOL 4.0 exploits that all came out were a result of, of that. Um, so that's like another claim to fame, I guess I had. Cool. Sorry. So so going back to the step one token, uh, I'm still kind of uh, really interested in this. So I, I want to pull on the thread a little bit more. So did you automate the GUI? to send out the spam or did you figure out a way just to j- just to like kind of replay the packets or, or, or um i forget what it's called scappy or something with python where you can build your own packets D- did you sit yeah uh, can you talk about which way you did it yes right so the way like i'll backtrack a little bit more and there was this password cracker that came out in i think it was 99 called uh trinu and it was by this guy trinoc and it was written in c plus plus 
and it was the fastest cracker ever made. It was it was insane, and it was leveraging because the AOL two five the, the the protocols. There were some different changes that were made in the handshakes and the cyclic redundancy checks and stuff. But he was the first one to really build a like what you would consider a windsock program for AOL that was scalable and, and amazing to, to the function that worked. A lot of what we were doing up to that time, because the AOL sign-on was kind of this black box that we couldn't really figure out how it worked. But what you could do is you could sign on with a client. And then once the program was actually signed on, like it had done the key exchange and password and login, you could hijack that session and then send the packets however you wanted to. Like past that whole sign-on process, then the packets weren't encrypted or anything like that. You could just kind of hijack it and then do whatever. So the Winsock programs of the day, like what they, you would do is you would subclass the sign in part of it. So you'd like go to like click, have it click guest and then, you know, sign in to the username and password. And then once it was like welcome, then you would just terminate the connection from the packet, like your program side or whatever, and then take over the session and negotiate it with that way. So the original Winsock mailers and stuff that we wrote by taking the packets, analyzing them and reversing the protocol, like we would, you would be able to have multi-threaded mailers where you're signed on to a bunch of different AOL accounts at once just via this method. Eventually, there were people that reverse engineered the sign on stuff. AOL lib.dll was probably the most famous. Um, there was a programmer slushy who actually wrote like a full fledged client that actually could interpret FDO. So you could actually basically have an entirely functional AOL client on top of it. But the AOL lib dealt with that sign on portion that I was talking about earlier. And so it became easier to spin up instances of that instantiate the AOL lib to negotiate the sign on process, hand off the socket handle to your program and then do everything over raw sockets. But the packets themselves weren't encrypted, so you could easily, well, not easily, it took some doing, but you would be able to reverse engineer exactly what was going on. And so, yeah, the mailers didn't have to even interface with the client anymore. Like, you didn't have to click send and blah, blah, blah. You're basically just sending the packets that would do that thing. Okay, that's great. Did, did AOL catch on and eventually start throttling and stuff? Or? Well, so that's... Um, I know I mentioned in our email outside of the podcast, but one of the cool things that they had done, actually, uh, with uh, Trinoc, the Winsock password crackers, is they made it to a point where they would silently kind of blacklist you. So when you're sending, like after you've sent a bunch of invalid password requests, if you were trying to crack, for instance, even if you sent a valid username and password combination from your IP address, it would just say invalid password. So you didn't know it was kind of being shadow banned. So you didn't know if you're, you were being blocked or not. So there were these countermeasures. America Online again, didn't have a really good detection system. As far as I know, whether you were using a thin client or a, like a real certified desktop client. So there's some issues. I think that because some of the stuff, like I said, the packet chunking uh, was kind of a weird thing to reverse engineer. So there was some people that wrote programs to where they would fill their packet with nulls to a point that the packets always stayed a static size. So they didn't chunk like weirdly. So if you were sending an email, for instance, it would automatically fill in the remaining body with null characters or spaces or something just to like fit a format. Uh, so they had a bit of detection around that type of thing, but largely... I said a lot of server side modifications, I think, were made, you know, to combat rate limiting um, because the room collection, too, we were able to do that through Winsock. So before you would, there'd be a list of rooms and you would click the who's chatting and uh, on the UI and it would pop up with a list of 23, 24 screen names that were in that room at the time. And then you would grab the list box and then close it. And then you just kind of iterate through the, that. And also same with the member directory if you're searching st strings and stuff. This was how you collected names to crack and names to spam. <laughs> so uh, it was just a good uh, OSINT way to, to find valid accounts. But that got rate limited to a point where, you know, you, if you're clicking who's chatting too much, it would block you. Uh, uh, same thing as if you were chatting and you sent more than four lines in a chat too quickly it would sign you off so i have a question if you you were saying before that you could kind of be a multiple accounts at once right so in theory could you yeah be collecting doing the room collection from multiple accounts at once to not get rate limited yeah so you would do this rotational thing okay so the, the way that actually it worked with aol was the window 
on AOL was AOL Frame 2.5. So uh, that was the, um, like when you were subclassing the America Online window, that was what it was. You could get on multiple accounts through the desktop clients if you just hex edited that part, um, because what it did, the original versions of AOL would just look and see if that instance was running, and if it was, it would shut down. So you couldn't open multiple desktop clients. In this case, like again, we were just multi-threading the uh, entire sign-on, you know, do whatever collection process, blah blah, hit the buddy list, whatever it was. But yeah, that the mailers, like the kind of all-in-one mailers that we're writing at the time. Um, I had one called Telekinesis that was pretty popular. Uh, that my FDO mailer was fairly popular, but it was more private. But a lot of them, like they would have like some accounts because you could mail. And uh, there was a point in time where you could mail and it wouldn't kick you offline. It would just tell you like, hey, you're mailing too much. You need to slow down. And so that account would just get flagged with a Boolean flag that says like can't mail right now. And then it would go in to start doing collection. And then uh, there was a program called Delilah that uh, me and my buddy Flo had written uh, that was an artificially intelligent chat bot. Well, quote unquote, artificially intelligent. It was pretty stupid. But that you could also have these accounts pretending to be girls and like just sitting in chat rooms and saying like, hey, 18 female, California, like ASL hit me up. And so at any given time, you could have a bunch of accounts doing a bunch of different things. Uh, and that was eventually, again, they would get terminated. But anytime, yeah, you're, you reach your collection limit on one, then you start mailing on it, then you start botting with it or whatever. So it was a way to just get the maximum amount of juice out of each. Wait, so what was the point of the botting to make the account seem real or? Yeah, so we get you know edit member profiles the same way um, all through. I said that you could do it through subclassing windows and stuff, but you could do it through through Winsock. But the thing I was spamming the most of at that time was porn sites, and there were a couple companies that would like pay per click, pay per sign up. But the pay per click worked out. Um, you have to just maintain a ratio, I think, of one to uh, well one to two hundred. So one sign up for every two hundred clicks. Or you got thirty-five dollars a sign up, but um, because of the volume of clicks that we were doing on our landers, and it actually made more money with the clicks um, as long as you maintained a ratio. But yeah, that you would have these accounts that would just pretend to be yeah women, and then they would just sit in the chat room and like spam like eighteen F want to chat, you know, hey I'm horny right now, you know, whatever it was, and then when they would get IM'd, it would, the script would pick up and then it would start discussing things with the whoever was hit them up. And then did it send people links to the site? Yeah, like we, I mean, we wrote in like um, keywords that were no goes. So if we asked ASL and somebody was like, I'm 13, you know, it would just stop talking to them. So there was certain, and there were certain things where if certain strings were in the screen name, because like, for instance, cat reps uh, were a community action team that they actually worked for AOL. So, uh, you know, sometimes they would hit up the accounts to try to induce them to do uh, stupid things. But yeah, that the conversation would just progress until a point where, you know, it's like when they would say, send me the link or it reaches the end of the tier system, it would send them the link and then they click on it and, you know, decide if they're signing up or not. That's funny. I mean, because like, if you think about it, there's like, well, one of those interactive voice response systems. But I mean, also like people that field phone calls at like call centers, they have scripts, right? That they that they go by, right? <laughs> it's kind of just a bunch of like if-thens. Oh, yeah. It was pretty ingenious at the time. I mean, now we have machine learning and GPT-3 and stuff that does all this on at scale. But, you know, again, it was, we developed this thing called a brain file and it had syntactically like it was just uh, certain keywords and then they were pipe delimited. So, you know, somebody who would say something like free porn link naked, you know, whatever that it would trigger on those. So if somebody said like, hi, or what's up or sup or how are you doing? Like it would normalize all of it. So it'd all be lowercase and then it would try to smash it together. So it would be readable by our program. But then depending on the types of things that they said, like it had the script had responses to that. So, you know, like no credit card or something. If somebody said that, then, you know, it would say like, oh, it's just for a free trial. Like we don't charge you that type of thing. Uh, I think it's, similar things are still in use today, but on Tinder bots and whatnot. Interesting. I think I saw, so I was like scrolling through your, your catalog of songs and there was one called Delilah. And I wasn't sure if you were just like singing like, uh, uh, yeah. a, a, is, is that what that's about? Cause I, I, cause I know there's another popular song called Delilah. Like about someone's lover or whatever. She's my fire, she's a fighter. When it comes down to the wire, she's the one I hire. She's a hot trick. 
got flicks to rock dicks Simply just the top pick If you're not sick, you'll get caught quick and then drop kick So back off, your rack's off Click the link and jack off You're the only bitch we love You're a gift from above You're never cheating Making our money even when we're sleeping Hustling those fools and chats Getting their credit card In the minute flat yeah, that song is about like the lyrics in that song are, um, you know, the, it's about our bot, but, but she's always working. You know, she never gets tired. Like and it's written like a love song, but it's very. Yeah, that knowing that it's a chat bot uh, is pretty much the, the context of of what that track is. But yeah, Delilah <laughs> is the only bitch we love. <laughs> Something like uh, <laughs> sent from above. She's never sleeping, making her or she's never creeping, making her money even when we're sleeping. Hustling those fools in chats, getting their credit card in a minute flat. It's been a long time since I've heard that song, but yeah, it's um, but yeah, that song is just about uh, the chat bots. That's funny. Okay, so that, that's kind of cool to get a little history on that song. Okay, so then when these when the calls got sent to AOL, I, I want to know what you, what do you think the backend was like? Was it like there were there store procedures that ran that took arguments, and or what's your thoughts on that? Well, that's where I was saying that the, a lot of the way we dealt with was this, you know, heavy, the slushy really, he really dove into the reverse engineering of the protocol and was able to emulate the entire kind of uh, like the same way that you would set up a world of Warcraft game server. Like I'm fairly certain the slushy got it to a point where he could emulate both the server and the client side and, you know, all the, the form elements and stuff that were available. Um, the thing that we were doing was a little bit more, I said, ham-fisted because we're taking the static packets that we were getting from the client and then just seeing how those worked and then working backwards. Uh, I wrote specifications. I said, there's a lot of stuff I don't remember, like, because there's, you know, fields for packet length. There's a, there's a sequence, there's two sequence bytes I remember that uh, would iterate and then like roll over eventually, but it was kind of like a, a counter. So for each packet that you sent, it had to be in sequence, obviously. Um, and then there was also these kind of health check ping pong packets. We, working off of half the information, there's some of the stuff, obviously, I think I could emulate correctly, but the limitations of what we actually did were obviously reverse engineer, the mail stuff, the instant messaging stuff, the profile stuff, the chat room stuff. But like, for instance, how to display a keyword or something, I don't believe, you know, we never really had any need to do something like that. So yeah, over the wire, um, I think the packets that we were concerned about were the ones that were going to make us money or something. Right. Okay. So I guess what I'm getting at is server side, when AOL received the calls, I, I guess like, I'm I'm wondering about like the architecture, like uh, like what was running on their servers that would accept the calls, and then once they accepted the call, would that relay it to like a database server or something that was running a store procedure? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, I, I know what you're saying. I think well, that's what I mean. I think that infrastructure wise, I mean, it, it is just this custom protocol. I said eventually, uh, said that I think it was AOL six and on started using Flap, and they had deprecated P three. You could still connect with old clients for a, a really long time. I think they're probably just trying to avoid alienating, you know, all the grandmas and stuff in Middle America that were still connecting with AOL four and whatnot. But Flap was actually part of like the Oscar protocol, which was the AIM kind of what the new AIM used. AIM had uh, the talk protocol and the Oscar protocol, but yeah, the newer stuff was flap. So it was completely different. And I think, but what was odd about it is obviously these packets from AOL one uh, all the way up through four, like that you were able to start not dialing into AOL, but you could connect via TCP IP. And that was where it was advantageous to have like an Earthlink account or a net zero account or again, something like my dad's slip account that you would connect to AOL like without the e -E 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 uh, modem stuff. But that framework, like whatever the, the protocol was over the wire um, through TCP IP was the same stuff that was actually being sent over the modem. So whatever protocol parser and stuff that they had on their back end, it was present in both the like dial up users and the, the internet users. Uh, it was homogenous. Right. Maybe I should probably tell you what I'm trying to lead you to. Um, Cause I'm really curious about this is the, cause I know when I was talking with Tao, we were trying to figure out like basically 
how, how there wasn't input standardization, right? Maybe there was kind of like JavaScript, right? Like there's like client-side validation, but there wasn't server-side validation. So in some of the requests, you could send like extra characters and get really long screen names and that kind of stuff. And I guess I'm trying to get at like what you think that their server-side looked like where they would just not have any kind of sanitization and just accept whatever and just um, run a cert procedure and create a screen name or whatever. I'm kind of getting at that, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so I don't think, because again, like I said, there's certain guardrails set up with, I said that packet sequencing. I mean, it's it's present in TCP IP where you have this error correction that's built in where like if I'm sending you packets over the wire and then you're like, wait, I need, I missed packet three, six, and nine. Can you send those back? Uh, AOL had a similar thing where post sign-on or whatever, the counter would start. And so you couldn't send, like there was still, it still had to be well formatted. Um, so all packets, you know, began with that Z asterisk asterisk. That was the the magic for the headers. I, I wouldn't say it was completely naked, but I mean, definitely because of those, like the 16 character thing, the, the screen name limit used to be 10. And then that it was lifted at around the AOL time, but people were able to make one character and two character screen names. There was indents like where, you know, you could have spaces at the beginning of your screen name. That was something that was found by Hypa um, with 2.7 Mac AOL client. Um, uh, he was able to find a way to, uh, to, to do it there. I, I forgot the exact details. Um, again, over the protocol itself though, like all of those things would have been possible uh, it's just through the UI, they were also made um, made possible. Well, I mean, it's possible to send it, but I'm talking about like server side. They like you know they, they would have. I guess they didn't have proper constraints, right, uh, on their variables. On 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 certain things, yes, but that's why I'm like I'm saying that there's if you sent a malformed packet with a bad cyclic redundancy check or whatever, it would reject it. So there were there was some amount of yeah like uh, sanitization and restrictions and stuff uh but again to what extent and and on what like where the compensating controls were i mean obviously the mail example i was giving you that some somebody missed that um that workflow stream because again that stayed alive well after um they had already implemented rate limiting and things so uh, i would say that there's probably you know in your stored procedure type thing whatever yeah actions that the I guess the server side was was taking and how it interpreted the packets and stuff was a bit of a black box. Uh, and so again, I only know kind of the interfacing, uh, but I trying to send because the packets had a limit of 255 bytes, if I remember correctly. So the, that was it. If you tried to send a packet that was oversized, it would truncate or it would drop. That's why I'm just saying it wasn't super wild, wild west where you could just kind of do whatever you wanted, but there was obvious gaps in their, um, in their, their checks. Okay, cool. And then I guess I want to switch gears a little bit to some of the other tools you're, I know you mentioned, um, like rain man and stuff, but I believe there is uh, something called Chris. Yes. So Chris was the Holy grail, uh, of America online because it, basically had all of the customer data on um, anybody that was an AOL member. Uh, had, you know, usernames, addresses, credit cards, uh, account notes, all that stuff. But they had made it so it wasn't accessible unless you were on the local area network. Uh, and another thing that AOL started instituting was the one-time password secure ID, uh, like rotating key thing. They had a thing called Defender Key as well. But you would sometimes you would crack these uh, internal accounts and uh, you would be presented with this secure ID prompt. And uh, you can't like it wasn't practical to really crack them uh, because they were six digit numbers and they would lock you out if you tried uh, too many times. But it was it was MFA, right? Like TOTP or whatever. Exactly. And that's I said, this was present in AOL, like back in the like late 90s, early 2000s. So, I mean, it's something that now is more in the zeitgeist. And we see, you know, regular users doing this, but it was a way that AOL protected their internal network. The thing that was crazy is, so part of these campaigns, these mail campaigns and stuff, you could also, we sent out a lot of password stealers, which uh, sometimes what they would do is they would just position a form over the login form, like a, a visual basic form that, that masked, it basically stat over the login and so people would think they were typing their password into the AOL client, but really they were typing it into this program. And then it would send it to us either via uh, email or post data to a web page. So you wind up having these collections of internal uh, emails. There was an internal tool called Phone, and it would give you all of the people that worked at AOL. 
Uh, so we built phone scrapers that would just kind of go through and grab everyone's screen names and details and numbers and just whatever details we'd have on internal employees. And then successfully, if we were able to you know, get password stealers on their account or whatever, Sub7 was also really big back then. I don't know if you remember like uh, Back Orifice, Sub7. Yeah, it was one of the first rats. That, that, was, that, that was great. Yeah, I remember that one. That was it. So the, the, one of the problems, though, is that once if you actually got like a foothold on one of those machines, like if you were able to sub seven an in, internal AOL employee, it would report back with a 10.0.0.0, you know, unratable address. Uh, inter- so internally own, internal only. And so me and I won't mention the other two, like just in case they are still kind of sensitive about this data, but we were kind of just concocting away like, well, what's a, a way that, you know, we could actually connect to these machines. And so, and the other thing too, is that the connection we'd want it to be able to pers- be persistent and available at all times. Cause obviously if the computers go offline, we, we didn't have dedicated machines at the time. Uh, it's something, you know, the whole kind of broadband uh, I mean, I had DSL at the time, but it wasn't like kind of ubiquitous in, in that sense. And it was about have, always having access. So the concept of a, of a reverse tunnel is what I wound up writing. And um, the America Online Service would connect on port 5190, uh, 5191 or 5192. But generally on the internal machines, 5190 and 5191 were always taken up already. Like the port was already bound on that system. The internal firewall, though, still allowed 5192 as a backup. So the program that I wrote, we had rooted a university server that basically served as the intermediary relay. And then when we got the Trojan installed on the internal machines, it would connect to the university box through port 5192. And then we could just connect to the university box at will and we can get on AOL's internal network. So all of those accounts that we normally weren't able to access. We just would log on through the LAN because we were just using that kind of tunnel into it. And then if you were on the LAN, you could just access Chris whenever you wanted (laughs) at will. Like it didn't prompt you or it prompted you to accept or whatever, but it didn't prompt you uh, for a secure ID or any of those things. I didn't, we didn't use it for any like weird nefarious purposes at the time. Like I think to, to some degree people that, what was kind of funny about it is that at that time on the internet, it wasn't as common to know who your real name was or know who you were. And so if somebody was talking shit in like an AOL chat room, and then you could immediately pull up like where they live and stuff, like you wouldn't see them sign online for a while. So that, that was kind of a common practice. I think people were leveraging that data to uh, to scare people, but that we just were trying to get cool screen names. And so like I had God, I had Jesus, I had... Uh, just everybody's first name. Everybody had their first name that was in my crew, provided they weren't an internal account. But uh, yeah, it was basically just a screen name grab. We weren't trying to do credit card fraud or anything like that. Interesting. So I just want to talk about this relay a little bit. So it would connect to the university server. And then would you use like IP tables and like DNAT or something and, and would it just route the connection or I, I guess I don't, I'm not fully understanding how it worked. No, it wasn't that like, yeah, it wasn't even that highbrow that basically the, the Trojan just had a persistent connection. The university server was always online and that was the benefit of that. And so the, the connection from the land machine to the, to the university box was just static and it worked kind of like an IRC BNC would like where, you know, you just, it's like a, it's just a proxy is all it is. So that university server just existed as a proxy into the land. So when I would connect into that machine, it would basically like hijack the session on the one that like was piped into the land. So it, just concept of, of a reverse tunnel is all it was, but uh, just think of it in terms of a proxy. Oh, okay. Got it. All right. So it was, uh, so in terms of like SSH, there's like a forward tunnel and reverse tunnel, right? So it was like, which one was it? Yeah, this is, this is a reverse tunnel. Cause you're, you're trying to, cause since the address that was, that's reported, you know, is this 10.0.0 unroutable one or whatever, you just get an outbound connection. So the same way that like go to my PC team viewer, like all these types of things work where they work with an outbound connection where they have a, this intermediary server that negotiates everything. Um, that's this, this is the same concept that just basically did that the LAN machine would just connect to the, the dedicated machine so it was always online, and then we would connect to the dedicated machine at will to get back into the LAN. 
So then how would you pull up Chris? Was that like a GUI app or is it an actual database? I mean, there's probably a database behind it, but how'd you connect to it? Just a keyword. So keyword CRIS. Um, just type that like the same way you'd go to AOL, like control K or whatever it was. And just, uh, yes. And then you just type in Chris uh, and wow. it would just pop up. So they, they, they really ate their own dog food, huh? <laughs> that's, that's crazy. hundred uh, percent. <laughs> Surprised they're using like kicks or something or whatever, like IBM DB2, or like, you know, but that, that's funny. They're using like actually on AOL a keyword. That's crazy. Yeah. There, I think Pegasus was the next iteration of it or something. Like I, I was kind of a little bit more out of the game by the time it, or Pegareach. I think that, is that what it's called? I, I said, I'm, I mean, this is like 20 years ago. So like some of the stuff's a little, a little foggy, but yeah, that, that was, but it was like I said, the holy grail of all AOL hackers, because realistically, like I said, you could that, you know, if somebody's talking shit to you in a chat room, you immediately know where at least their whoever holds the credit card of their account lives um, and stuff. But you see the notes, address, like it, you could reset the passwords. Uh, you could do, you know, a wealth of things in the old Chris system. So well, once you're on the internal network, could any employee access anything in Chris? Was there like any limits at all to this? No. So you had like, there were certain accounts that did certain things. And so the, where that, another thing that was edited or uh, apparent was that like, there was these things called view rules, which are basically role based access control. So keyword ISO was one that ISO was one that internals could access. This was a way that you could do a litmus test of what the access was. And so ARC ARC uh, was a way you could test for an overhead account An overhead account would allow you to scroll, like you could type as much as you wanted in a room and it wouldn't kick you offline. But they were, so if you were an AOL advertiser, like I said, a person that had a, uh, a business uh, or a keyword or something, or you did advertising through AOL, they would give you what's called an overhead account, which meant it was billed to AOL. So you, it was a free account. It was kind of just a comp account that was given to you for being an AOL, they said ad, whether you put ads on there or something like you basically were giving them some sort of revenue. Those were given out to human beings. Um, but yeah, the internal accounts, uh, all of them, uh, to my knowledge, could access the ISO keyword. And so that was a way that you could test if it was an internal. But not all internals had access to Chris. Uh, the Chris accounts were usually like sit reps. Um, i trying to remember like what all their prefixes were. But certain accounts were view ruled basically just to see Chris. It was usually the ones that were enabled with Secure ID. Some of this data, like <laughs> I'm just trying to recall it, uh, the hash table's fuzzy, but to answer your question, not all internals had access to, uh, to Chris. Uh, okay, so not all internals had access to Chris. Um, so you guys would do a test, but once you had access to Chris, you could access any customer record at any time. And they're, I guess maybe they didn't have very good auditing too about like who was accessing what at what like rate and stuff like that. I think they did. Um, Merlin was another system. I, uh, sorry, like that I thought of, but yeah, that there had to have been because like in, in the process of doing this stuff, uh, obviously there was internal accounts that were getting killed, you know, as we were doing resets and stuff like that. So I, there was some amount of audit chain that was going on. I don't know to what extent, like if merely viewing an account, uh, fired an event, or if you had to actually do something like change the password, uh, it's something I'd be interested to like, you know, yeah, talk to an AOL systems engineer or something like that on, but yeah, there was definitely some kind of auditing going on because they would terminate these accounts if they found fishy activity on them. So it wasn't necessarily just super wild west. Uh, and this is where I said AOL had a lot of, like to their credit, it's odd because, I mean, here we are 20 years later and some of these kind of, you know, auditability chains and stuff that we talk about in information security at scale, like that AOL, I mean, kind of had to get that maturity fairly early. Because uh, they were dealing with so many weird issues. Yeah, definitely. And I was actually just thinking earlier today, like AOL. I mean, generally, you'll make a product to get some market right, and then you kind of just deal with stuff as it comes up. And it sounds like you know maybe they're just putting. It's like I don't know, was it patching a plane while it's flying or whatever? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. So okay, and then at some point there was like a news story that broke right about people accessing Chris that were not AOL employees, and I think you were quoted in one of those news stories. Yeah, again at the time. I had written the bulletin and I'd done, you know, so when the media request and stuff came in, I was willing to talk about it, but that the, I was talking about it in a kind of a third person -y way where it's like someone who isn't me, my friends, you know, who did this and stuff were the perpetrators of it. Uh, as I said, 
like from a breach standpoint, like we were just our methodology and our, our reasons for doing it weren't like to, uh, we could have downloaded everyone's credit cards if we wanted to, because again, automating the process, scraping, you know, iterating through the member database provided, I said the audit chain that we were just talking about, like if it wasn't as robust as I'm thinking it was, then it would have been possible to expose information like that. Now, you know, in today's world, if something like that were to happen, it'd be an extinction level event. And, you know, you're definitely getting your door kicked in and all types of stuff uh, that, you know, companies don't really have any room to move when it comes to GDPR violations and, uh, you know, breach disclosure, (laughs) all that type of stuff. So a sign of the times, you know, again, I don't know how aggressively they pursued it. But yeah, the the biggest thing I would say at the time was... uh, scary, but it wasn't something that I think people even really wrapped their head around. It's not like today when Equifax gets hacked and then pretty much, you know, even your grandparents are talking about it. Yeah, right. That, that's that's so true. So it sounds like it was pretty innocent. I mean, just in terms of like how stuff escalated o- over the years, like with the TJ Maxx stuff and like ransomware and like you guys just wanted like cool screening. Sounds like. <laughs> Yeah, the, I mean, the money, like, like off the spamming stuff was probably a little bit more interesting, you know, because the AOL member base, like, usually came credit card in hand. And as I said, not necessarily the most tech savvy. So it was one of those places. I mean, that I don't, like, feel so whatever about. But the the chaotic neutral kind of alignment in me, I, like, on God, never d- committed any cr- credit card fraud in my life. Like, I'm, I'm wrapped about it and stuff like that. But it's the one thing I think I've said consistently that because of the hassle of doing something like that, uh, I, you know, I've had my wallet stolen. I know what it's it's like. And even, even then that there's just certain things I think cross a a bit of a line that there's some hijinks and pranky stuff that I would do, but you know, any of the like large scale financial crime, things like that were not really interesting to me. I can't say the same as some of my colleagues, but yeah, by and large, it's not something that ever really interested me. Got it. So in one of the songs, I think you, you had collaborated uh, with dual core. Uh, one of the lyrics was multi-threaded brute forcing secure ID tokens. Did that really happen? Did it say that or did I? Um, I it, was just, it was one of the lyrics. I, I'm not sure you said it. It was probably in, but remember, I, as I said, that that wasn't necessarily practical because the key space was a uh, zero, 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 uh, six zeros through nine, 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 nine. So you had a million chances And after the same way I was telling you about the password thing, where eventually they would just start dumping, um, rejecting even valid combinations that secure ID, like I never had a successful secure ID cracker. I don't think anybody really did. Uh, So dual core was probably just making a a little goof there. Um, One of the tactics I remember is the same sort of thing I was telling you about the password stealer, that there were people that I know that were successfully able to the light, the half life of this was very short because you would kick the person offline, but that people were building password stealer esque type things over the secure ID box. And then you still had like a minute window or whatever, the same way one time passwords work now. So sometimes people were able to successfully fish an internal and then capture their secure ID as they type it in and log onto the account that way. That's the only other kind of thing I, I really know that was. Are you saying they subclass that window and they capture the window they typed it into? Well, if they got like the, so, if they were able to get the the because pa- the password stealer has to it's a trojan that has to run on the client computer, so that if you could initiate a login or like when that user logged in, uh, and then you would s- capture the secure ID, it would send it, but you would only have like that minute window until that secure ID token expired to sign on. So you had to be really really quick when you did that. Um, but yeah, that was just like overlaying a text box over the secure ID text box. So that way you'd, you'd have it just visually overlaid and they would type it in the fake text box. It would send it to you and then also WM set text to the actual secure ID uh, window text box and then hit OK. Wow. So, I mean, if you compare that to today, to like Evil Gen X, which is like the reverse proxy to steal like uh, people's one-time tokens, this is like the, the old version of it, which is really working with the actual like fat client, right? As opposed to the, the web client. That's, that's kind of interesting. I mean, eye framing, there's, an, there's another method I've seen. I forgot what it's called uh, that's kind of out now, but about like 
it's building like Z order web pages, like after you kind of controlled the DOM. Uh, again, I forget the nomenclature, but it's something that in InfoSec right now is actually kind of a weird hot topic is like that it's like using like page injection, HTML injection or whatever, like just overlaying, you know, whatever the actual page is supposed to be and then intercepting all of the um, the stuff. Yeah. Isn't it like they would, they would make it a frame where it would have an address bar and then they use like CSS or something and then it make it appear like an address bar was there. And so then they could put whatever they wanted in the address bar and it looked like you're at the real site or something. Yeah, it looks, yeah, it, it just emulates like, uh, looks a lot like, you know, it's, it's a good way to do phishing pages and stuff. I'm, I just, I'm trying to hit the Google machine to see like what they, because I said, there's always these stupid names that InfoSec professionals come up with, like phishing, smishing, vishing, wishing, lishing, dishing, you know, and it, so it's got one of those like cute names or whatever, but realistically, it's just, uh, yeah, it's just like the same way that phishing pages emulate like whatever page they're trying to um, attack, like it's that, but you know, if you were able to inject that page programmatically, um your phishing page on the domain itself, it, it just looks like it's the same thing. <laughs> Somebody will tell me, I'm sure, after this podcast is released, what the... Uh... <laughs> right, right. Well, you can always put it in the show notes, too. Okay, so then it sounds like you liked spamming, you liked having custom screen names, you and your buddies. Uh, did you also get into any other AOL uh, tricks or, or hacks? Um, like I said, the... Keyword defacement stuff, like I started getting more inf- in- interested in the like the web server because when AOL started to move off the key- keywords and join, uh, you know, the real internet and stuff, they they had a lot of internal web pages and things. So exploiting those was type was fun, but it was just a giant playground. And you know, as we were talking about earlier, that it was really neat how collaborative everybody was. There wasn't a whole lot of um, the people, I mean, people had methods that they held close to their chest that were kind of secret, but largely everyone was very, very helpful and tried to be, um, you know, inclusive. And, you know, it's some of my best friends today, you know, are people that I met, uh, you know, just on that scenes. And, you know, they eventually, when I started my web board of digital gangster, like a lot of those guys and girls came on from AOL and joined uh, our board and stuff so like i i have mad love for steve case uh for the creation that he he made because it did i would say change my life in a lot of ways that i mean there was just a it was a playground it was insane so then did that really set you up for like a career in in infosec i would say in parallel like because i would you know obviously that i was the stuff on AOL, what made it so interesting was the fact that the member base was so large and it was a unique system that, you know, posed a lot of interesting challenges. I, I wouldn't like, I was already obviously kind of a, a hacker, you know, in the BBS scene and, you know, reading zines and stuff prior to getting on AOL. So, but that's, I, so I wouldn't say it was necessarily the the genesis of my InfoSec career or anything, but it was definitely a giant part of it, um, for sure. Okay, since we're talking about the genesis of stuff, what influence did Weird Al Yankovic uh, have on you? I mean, was, was he the original Nerdcore? Or I don't know, because I, I know I'm reading everywhere that you started your Nerdcore, but who, who was first? I don't know. Well, nerd, the, definitely. Like, the, I think that there was, I mean, uh, the Wikipedia page of Nerdcore, if I remember it from 10 years ago or something, is pretty decent kind of pedigree you know, at least the, what proto nerdcore um, consisted of back in the day. Um, but yeah, nerdcore as a genre was coined by MC Front a lot, and I just happened to be making music in that genre and not really knowing what it was called, and then identified with it uh, after it was, you know, give it a name type thing. But yeah, Weird Al, I would say because he's such a talented musician in a lot of different ways, I wouldn't really label him as, as nerdcore. Uh, it's almost pejorative to call him such a thing. No, I'm specifically talking about all about the penny. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or white and nerdy. Um, yeah. And I mean, he's definitely like one of us. MC Lars is actually really good friends with him. But the Weird Al, well, and as I said, a lot of the songs that I made about AOL uh, in back, you know, in the late nineties, early two thousands were all just parody songs. I took like regular hip hop songs off the radio and then spun them, um, you know, into, uh, AOL centric type music along with my original catalog. Okay, cool. So what are you up to these days? I work at a giant company as a AppSec manager. 
not hard to find out who, but uh, yeah, that, yeah, I've just, I mean, I'm now I'm an elder statesman and I don't really like have time to commit as many crimes as I used to. Uh, I jaywalk occasionally and, and whatnot, but uh, you know, I, I leave it to the youngins. The, the next generation of hackers that are coming out are insane. One of the things I say a lot, I think, is if the bug bounty scene was as prevalent when I was coming up and doing all this stuff, I probably would have gravitated more towards that than the, um, you know, like the, the criminal activity. But uh, yeah, like I love hacking. It's like the curiosity, the adversarial mindset, just breaking things, like figuring out how things work. Uh, so between that and music, I stay pretty busy. Cool. I think I heard on another podcast I was listening to, you were talking, I want to go back to 2014, uh, to the Niels album. I believe you said you have like a whole prequel recorded, like from in like, and it's done a year ago and you never released it. And you're thinking about it. Do you have any update on that? It's been done since 2019. It's just uh, the pandemic. So like part of the, I mean, it might just operate as a time in history, but that a large piece of the album takes place in like the startup culture type thing in the cool office with the ping pong table and the uh, the cornhole uh, stuff. And it's like that a lot of the applicability of it in you know today's day and age, I mean, it is a prequel, so it doesn't really matter. But this, I think there was a certain sensitivities around why I didn't really feel it was appropriate um, or something. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's like, I said, yeah, it's, it's done. It's been done. Um, I just need to put a bow on it and, and get it out. Um, okay. Yeah. Thanks so much for being on today. Um, this is super cool. I'll put a bunch on the show notes. Um, if you have any any screenshots or anything of any old programs. What I, I, I love that you're doing this. I, I don't think I've ever talked about this stuff. Like really that because uh, it's such like a moment in time that is like a, you had to be there type thing. Um, and there's a, I call it the Alpha Omicron Lambda fraternity. Like we just, that there's this sort of underpinning and there's so many of us that went on to have really successful careers and again, largely in touch with a lot of people from that scene. And it's just fascinating to me because there's just so many of these kind of moments lost in time, like Tears in the Rain, Blade Runner type thing where that yeah, if you were there, the feeling was just insane. It was just like feeling like we were doing something at scale and crazy and, you know, being a teenager and just having this large kind of palette uh, and canvas to, to to mash with. I don't know, like I said, but that's what I just love that you're doing this this podcast, uh, you know, whether or not it like gets huge listenership or anything uh, still, I just believe it's important to document for the historical record that these took place. Yeah, definitely. I'm still in, a, in this for, for, the, for the listenership. I, I, I have uh, zero expectation of this blowing up because I mean, one, like I'm not doing like a dark night diary thing where I'm like pausing every five minutes to explain what something is. So um, <laughs> there's that. Right. And um, I'm just not sure if people will be interested besides people that were there. But I think people that were there, they, they love just, just uh, hearing about this stuff. Like for me, uh, hearing you talk about this stuff, it's just so cool knowing, uh, knowing that all those things were going on and, and learning about it. Like for me, like hearing about overhead accounts was just like almost in whispers. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, and then to hear that, like how deep you took it and stuff, it's, it's super cool. Well, and that's, yeah, it, it is, it's, and there's varying degrees of this stuff. Like a lot of people have AOL stories, uh, you know, from varying, like you said, you said, had a wares background, uh, you know, like one of my good friends uh, that I just saw last week, he had the first Whitey Cracker fan site on the internet actually, but he's a giant macro artist. Like he would draw the, you know, the graffiti, the ASCII graffiti for the wares groups and, you know, but he wasn't, I mean, he'd punted people and uh, tossed people and stuff, but he wasn't like really in the scene. He wasn't a programmer himself. And, you know, he's not in security, but like still has very vivid and cool memories of those times. And and so it's nuts because there is a, a varying degree of experiences that were there. Uh, there was a group called Lithium Node um, back in the day that w- like they were out of, out of Denver and they had done a lot of the original kind of crazy hacks against AOL that were more like low level, uh, impressive type things. And I idolized those guys. Uh, and they're still part of the kind of hacker community for 303. I, as I said, that there's just this crazy family tree uh, that spans uh, fairly f- deep and wide. That's it's super super interesting, and it's just awesome when I you know hear people that were kind of in the scene and uh, you know had a different experience because uh, you know they 
may have heard about something that we'd done or whatever. And that was just what it was about getting up. Awesome, man. Well, thanks for coming on the show today. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Goodbye.